Well, welcome everybody and thank you for coming out this morning. Uh, it's good to see it's a great turnout uh, for our monthly TRED talk and of course our featured military month this, this month. And I just want to recognize a few people that are here today. We only have our speaker, Dr. Robert Smith, and his lovely wife, Karen, right up here, came with her. And then we also have uh, um, the Lockwoods, Kevin and Wendy, over here, and they're the owners of the half track back there. And Julie and Bernie Carlson out there, they have that slap grill Jeep out here. So after our tread talk, they're going to be out in the floor for a little bit. So if you have some questions about those vehicles, go on out, and we'd be glad to hear a little bit more about the history of those and how they restored them, and just some fascinating facts about them. So. Um, anyway, we're honored again this year to have Dr. Robert Smith with us. And if you were here last year, you know what an excellent presenter he is. So, just so glad that he uh, agreed to come back again this year and talk on a different topic. No, nope, no leaving. That's locked. <laughs> but anyway, uh, Bob was born in Nebraska and attended Nebraska University, where he majored in history. He has always had a love for history and a particular interest in military history, as he comes from a military family. His father was a World War II veteran and a career Air Force senior NCO. Prior to his return to academia and advanced degrees, Bob managed a family-operated business where he learned management organizational skills. He returned to academia in 1998, attending Kansas State University, receiving a Master of Arts in Military History in 2004, and a PhD in Military History in December 2008. I guess that means you know what you're talking about. Currently, <laughs> Currently, Bob is the director of the Fort Riley Museum Complex out of Fort Riley, Kansas. I uh, just want to pause a moment, and Bob and his team have been so generous the last couple of years of loading us that wonderful display out in the lobby of the military uniforms, and we appreciate that very much, Bob. Um, after hours, he teaches military history through Kansas State University uh, for MAN program and Kansas University's OSHA Lifelong Learning Program. He has co-authored a book on the history of Fort Riley and is the author of numerous articles on military subject. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to you, Bob, and we're going to sit back and enjoy your presentation. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Actually, actually, Doug, the last article I wrote was about the um, influenza epidemic at Fort Riley just prior to COVID. So don't blame me for that. Well, it's great to be <laughs> It's great to be here. Uh, we're going to talk about the mechanization of the United States Army in World War II, and this is going to be a tale of two armies. I'm going to actually do a little comparing and contrasting. I know in all of the movies you know, you've seen, and Hollywood doesn't ever get it quite right in history, uh, but in all of the movies you've seen you know, the Germans have all of these vehicles and these tanks and everything, and they're rolling. But what we're going to find out today is that wasn't specifically the case, because only, only, and I the caveat is uh, there were only two fully mechanized armies in the world in 1941. One was the United States Army and the other was the British Army. Now the British Army though lost a lot of their vehicles when they retreated out of France and the Dunkirk operation. So we had to resupply them with vehicles. These two quotes I begin with are very telling. First of all, the American army swam to victory on an ocean of gasoline. And this was from a captured German officer when they interrogated him at the end of the war. They were always very jealous. The Germans were very jealous of the amount of mechanization that the United States Army had. And the US had a different take on fighting uh, in World War II. We decided that our industrial base was strong and significant enough that we could make up Norton there, uh, that we could make up uh, the, our shortage of manpower in vehicles and in supplying uh, those vehicles throughout the war to not only the United States, but to many other nations. I want to start off by showing you that the United States was car automotive minded in 1939. And these numbers here, is there were 40 million vehicles in the world, but the United States could account for 75% of all of those vehicles here. And these numbers are quite telling. And if you read this across here, uh, France, this is 23.3 people per vehicle for automobile. You go down here to Germany, Germany, 37.5 to one vehicle. And these are the people uh, in the 1930s that built the Autobahn. And so there's sort of a 
bit of a disconnect here, but come down here to the United States, and it was 4.4 people per automobile. So the United States in 1939 was mechanized, uh, automobile-minded. Uh, most of the folks that lived in the United States, a great majority of them, knew how to drive, knew how to take care of uh, their vehicles, knew some maintenance. And so the United States entering into World War II kind of had a leg up on mechanization. And that's going to show, uh, that's what I'm hoping to show today. So, what I said is this is going to be a talk about comparing and contrasting two armies. So let's begin with the German army here. Vehicles versus horses. Did you know that the German army in 1939 all the way up to 1945 that there were, uh, that they were only 30% mechanized? The other 75% were horses and these good things, your feet. And so it took, and then here we look at, it took 60 horses to move one battery of German artillery. And that's not counting the food that it takes. So if you're thinking about being a horse heavy army, you're always going to have to have extra horses to haul that feed. And uh, so it's, and the other thing about horses is that horses are fairly, uh, prone to sickness and illness, and so you constantly have to worry about that, eating the wrong type of forage, uh, eating green forage, etc. So, the 1939 to 1941 time period, the, horse, uh, the German army was basically dependent on horses. And I know you see these movies and you see this, you know, Private Ryan, Kelly's Heroes, uh, Fury, all of these movies, you see Germans loaded with vehicles, not the case. The German army uh, operated using horses. Now, the German army also believed that with its victories in 1939 over Poland, 1940 over France, uh, the Benelux countries, Norway, uh, Denmark, all of those, and then uh, into the Balkans in 41, and then into Russia, they believed it was going to be a very short, short war that they had overrun so many occupied countries that by the, end of the, uh, by the end of 1941, they thought that the war was pretty much going to be over and they did not plan for a protracted war. So, anywhere, anyway, uh, by the way, interesting point here is as the Germans moved, especially into Russia in 1941, that they began to push their vehicles, this 30% of vehicles beyond their limit. And the most interesting thing, well, there's two interesting things here. One is that German armor, you could push a tank to 500 miles and then it needs a major overhaul. Tanks are almost like horses in that they need constant care and equipment uh, on their equipment. And so you could 500 miles, overhaul. The second thing is you need fuel to run those. And so it took 35.8 tons of fuel to move a Panzer division 100 miles. Now the question becomes, well, where are they going to get this oil from? And this handy little map shortly. Mechanization issues continue. 2.5 million horses died in the course of the war. Horses were used up until 1945. The Germans also believed that in the First World War, their railroads had uh, almost achieved victory for them uh, in those initial months of 1914, World War I, and so that they could use railroads to supply their logistical needs and move hay for the horses or POL, what we call POL in the military, petroleum, oil, lubricants, uh, within uh, marching distance. The problem is, is they, when they moved into Russia, and Russia, this vast area of Russia that they overran uh, in 1941, that they discovered the railway gauges were different. And the railway gauges are different, so what do you do? You know, you can't use that unless you capture rolling stock. Well, the Russians learned very quickly, destroy your rolling stock as you retreat. 
So what the Germans had to do in Russia in order to supply their armies is they had to bring uh, railway troops in to rebuild and put that into the German gauge so that their German rolling stock could work. Also, the lack of abundant POL. Hitler began his war in 1939 having only one significant uh, fuel uh, area, and that was in Romania, not even in Germany. It was in Romania, but Romania was an ally. And from the map here, and this is the extent of the uh, German advance up to 1942, and what you have is you have fuel here to run your mechanized army in Romania, and the next possible place is in the Caucasus mountain region right here, and they never achieved that. They never achieved that, so they're depending on fuel here. Now, we think about German engineering. German uh, technological advances even during the war. I mean, they're the ones that had the, uh, the first jet. They're the ones that had the first uh, rocket, un, uh, unmanned rocket. Uh, but they were very late in coming to the table in creating synthetic fuels and using their abundant coal reserves uh, to create synthetic fuels. But it came very, very late. Again, pointing out that the Germans believed that the war would be uh, a very short, of short duration. So, the Germans basically have uh, a horse-drawn, basically 19th century army against the United States. Now, there are four reasons, and these are according to me. So you can take them or leave them, but there are four reasons why the United States Army mechanized when it did prior to the Second World War. The first one was Eisenhower's 1919 uh, trip across the United States by motor vehicle. And it's a fascinating study. Eisenhower realized, he actually wrote, uh, you know, until making it through Ohio, the roads are great, but and I don't know why Doug said this, but when they got to Nebraska, the wheels, the wheels fell off, actually. But the wheels actually did fall off. They said, oh, the roads are terrible. And they got through Nebraska, and they just got worse. When they got to Utah and Nevada, it was just a nightmare. And so what Eisenhower realized is he kept this in mind when he became uh, the future chef leader, the head of European forces, uh, of uh, allied forces in Europe. And he remembered this. And the great thing that comes out of this 1919 is that those of you that could, re those of you that remember, uh, Eisenhower during his administration in the 50s, the interstate highway system, and this all comes from that 1919, 62 days to cross the United States. The second major issue is the Ford Motor Company and go out, and Doug, you've got a Model T out there. Go out and look at that Model T, and look at that, because the introduction of the Model T from 1908 to 1927, most Americans could afford this car. 390, don't you wish you could buy a car for $395 and it still runs? But $395, so most Americans could afford a car in the 1920s. And we became motor-minded. We became mechanized. The third thing is that we had this huge industrial base. We were one of the fastest growing uh, industrial base uh, in the early 20th century. And we uh, really uh, concentrated on automotive, vehicles, steel, all the things necessary to uh, create a vehicle. And uh, so, Coming out of the Depression in 1939, when the war began in the United States, President Roosevelt instituted two programs that really built up America's industrial base after the Depression. One was uh, the end of the Neutrality Act in 1939 and bringing the uh, cash and carry to our allies. Anyone that has cash can carry weapons back. And what had happened was, well, France and Great Britain jumped on this immediately. 
But by 1940, France was occupied by the Germans. And in 1940, Winston Churchill goes to uh, Roosevelt and says, we're out of money. And so what we have is the land lease program. We're going to give you these vehicles, this industrial, uh, the US industrial might, these war industry uh, uh, products. And we're going to bring those and let you have those. And it allowed the United States to expand rapidly that industrial base. And that kind of ties into number four, which is the army maneuvers of 1941. In the 1941, there were two major uh, sets of army maneuvers, one in Louisiana. And what was really interesting in Louisiana is we had horse cavalry units, but we had armored units. And the armored units outperformed the horse cavalry units. And so George Marshall, who was chief of the army at that time, decided that this was the way of the future, that mechanization. And he was looking at what was going on in Europe with the Germans and their blitzkrieg and uh, those tactics. And it tested the mobility and said, OK, we have a civilian population that will become soldiers that are uh, that know about automobiles and how they autom and, uh, and any kind of vehicle, how they can operate those. Secondly, we have the industrial base that can supply those vehicles. And thirdly, we can graph that, these two points onto the Army and we can then decide to build our World War II Army into a fully mechanized force. So, here's the production. And I'm looking at this over a half a million Jeeps were produced. How many do we have yet today? I mean, you know, your vehicles here, the vehicle, the MVPA folks and everything, uh, there's just a fraction of those uh, yet. But we're, we're producing over a half a million of those vehicles. Harley Davidson motorcycles. 70,000, four by four, three quarter ton trucks, 53,000. But you look at these numbers, and these were produced between 1941 and to 1945. And so we have this huge industrial ability, and we can put them to use. And so we can have a fully mechanized American force. We don't have to depend on horsepower anymore. I might add one other point. We learned from our mistakes in World War I. In World War I, when we entered the war, we were woefully unprepared for the war. And what we ended up doing was buying British and French equipment. And so by 1939, when we knew war was imminent, uh, that we could supply not only ourselves, but the rest of the world, the, uh, the free world, uh, with vehicles. Again, American production, armored vehicles, the light tank, the Stuart light tank, 13,000, the second iteration of the Stuart tank, 8,000. Uh, the light tank that came in in 19... This tank, the M24, came into operation in late 1944, and we still built over 4,000 of them. The Sherman tank, and this is uh, the wisdom of the American uh, industrial base. You know, the Sherman wasn't an ideal tank, but the idea was if we build enough of them, it will lead us to victory. And so we're not going to go off on all kinds of tangents and build modifications. We're going to build a tank that works, that is reliable, and then just keep on producing, producing nearly 50,000 tanks. So look at these half tracks. We've got a half track out here. 53,600 half tracks were produced during the, uh, the war. So these numbers are just staggering here. But the American soldier too. Why walk when you can ride? And so walk. So the Americans went to war. They were proficient in driving. They knew about vehicles. And so we were a fully mechanized army. And the American soldier and soldiers 
And those of you that are veterans out there will understand this, that soldiers, if they find something that works and they don't have to walk, they're going to find a ride. And uh, uh, th I think this, this photograph uh, just, uh, just proves my point. Now, I had to add something here, and it's a little lighter touch, is I've often wondered how many soldiers you can get on a tank. And the Germans, even though they weren't as fully mechanized as the United States, I think win the prize because we have this. <laughs> we have this. And I think they hold the record, even though uh, soldiers, if you can get a ride, why walk? So anyway, but there is a problem. There is a problem. You're mechanized. They don't run on air. You've got to worry about supplies. And you've got to worry especially about POL. And so these, I think, are very telling. First of all, the head of logistics in the United States Army during the Second World War basically said, you stick to the basics to maintain high level of performance. Don't get off on tangents. There are three basic items that soldiers need in a mechanized army. The first one is pretty much self-evident, POL, petroleum, oil, lubricants. But yeah, what about the soldier? He needs ammunition and he needs food. And so you concentrate on those three uh, issues there. Now, there's never enough trucks. That's, that supply tail is going to be incredibly long. And so during the Normandy invasion here and the march across France, you have 47 allied divisions. And an army division just do the math. I, that's why I'm a historian. I have no ability in math. I have absolutely, uh, in college I took what was called Math 101, which everybody called was dummy math. Anyway, let's just take that. 47 divisions. A U.S. Army division requires 650 tons of supplies per day. And I'm only talking about those three, those three critical supply issues. So, and the next, next problem is we invaded France, a little history here, a digression. We invaded France in Normandy. And the problem is that uh, we needed a deep water port. And the only deep water port in Normandy was Cherbourg, right here. Well, the Germans destroyed the port before we could take it in uh, July of 1944. So the rest of the deep water ports are along the Channel Coast. And as we advance across France, uh, George Patton, his famous run around France, you're going to make, you're going to do 400 miles inside of two months. By September, we're on the frontier with Germany. How are we going to supply those vehicles? And Eisenhower was always very ready to accept any kind of suggestion. You know, he went with uh, Montgomery's suggestion, well, maybe a deep thrust, and we put all our supply uh, in just one British army and thrusting into, uh, uh, into Holland and getting across the Rhine. Well, this drove Patton up a wall because Patton thought, well, he should thrust uh, into Germany, across the Rhine, into the Colmar area here. And so Eisenhower was constantly uh, given the problem of how do you supply a mechanized army? You need those three critical things. And just to go back here, uh, so the British sector, their supply issues are a little less daunting than the Americans because they're advancing along the channel uh, coastline, although most of those channel ports that could supply the army with those lubricants with those uh, uh, POL, thank you, uh, the uh, uh, rations and also the ammunition, uh, their supply issues weren't as critical as the United States. However, the United States, they're advancing 400 miles and they need to be supplied. And so there were never enough trucks to supply that 
sort of that mechanized army. So there, it, there are drawbacks, there are advantages and disadvantages. And so what we've come to is basically um, more trucks. The army now will need more trucks if we're going to be fully mechanized. And that is a lesson learned at the end of the Second World War. Not only producing a mechanized army for the United States, we're producing for other nations. And these are Lend-Lease deliveries. And you can look at the amount of vehicles. Great Britain received 104,000 Jeeps. The Soviet Union, the Soviet Union didn't want our tanks. They wanted our trucks so they could advance. And so we sent 190,000. And of course, uh, France, the Free French, that actually really gets into the war in 1943 and then in 1944 actually is one of the uh, major units that drives deep into their home country. We're supplying them with vehicles. And so the industrial might has created uh, mechanized forces, not only for the United States, but for Great Britain, and then the Soviet Union and France. And by the way, uh, just a couple of notes here. I made sure I had a British tank here uh, under the Great Britain. And here's a bunch of Russian soldiers in a Lend-Lease Russian Sherman. So that brings me to the conclusion. World War II demonstrates that a mechanized army could accomplish rapid advances. However, and that's a big however, limitations on supply you needed that critical POL. You had to be able to run those vehicles. You needed that food and ammunition, and it has its limitations because if you advance too far, too fast, you're gonna run out of steam or gas. So anyway, uh, I will be happy to entertain any questions, but the two things I would like you to take away is, hey, Next time you see a movie, my wife won't see movies, historical movies with me anymore because I'll say, oh, that's not right, you know. So if you see the German vehicles, that's not right. Oh, why did they put that in there? You know, that's not correct. So just think of, think of this, that uh, the United States uh, was on the cusp of being the first totally mechanized army. And this happened during the Second World War. And the second point is, Though, if you're going to have a mechanized army, you've got to have that logistical tail to supply those troops. And final point, whenever I talk to soldiers at Fort Riley, whether they be infantry, artillery, or um, armor, or things, I always tell them, remember, you're nothing. You're nothing, and I'm a great believer in this, without logistics, because you need somebody to supply you. You need that bean counter behind the lines that's able to get you that fuel, that food, and that ammunition. Otherwise, you won't be able to fight. Thank you so much. Uh, I will be happy to entertain questions, if that's all right, Doug? Yes, sir. Early on, you mentioned that a rebuild for a tank was about 500. Mm, yes, yes, sir. Is that comparable for the Allied tanks as well, or are you only talking about German? I was talking about German, but it's comparable for the uh, for uh, ar armored, and actually that goes down significantly if we talk about uh, in desert conditions, because the British and the United States uh, in North Africa and the Germans constantly had to. I think it was with a hundred, hundred and twenty miles. Then you had to practically rebuild that tank, the mechanical issues in that tank, the engine, the transmission, and all of that. Uh -huh. So, uh, yes. And the Russians, we don't even want to talk about the Russians. I mean, Russian T-34 tank, um, the interesting thing about that is the Russians didn't teach, uh, treat their tanks very well. I mean, they were very, uh, they were crudely built, but every T-34 Russian tanker was issued a, ha uh, a large hammer. And that hammer was to hit and be able to switch gears on that T-34. And so, uh, but 
the T-34 was another example of, of the Russians being able to stick with one design. And that one design stayed with them with upgrades, with upgrades. The Germans had a major problem. The Germans had a major problem during the war. They kept creating variations, and that put their uh, uh, industrial uh, ability to produce down. Because in 1943, the primary German tank was the uh, Panzerkampfwagen IV, which was actually designed before the war, but gone through serious upgrades. But what the Germans found out is, you know, this is not quite right. We need a new tank. So they created the five, which was the Panther tank, which was an excellent tank. The only problem is, is they had industrial ability to produce fours in a particular factory where they had to actually retool and then produce the five. So that slowed production down and that created the problem. Yes, sir. With all the mechanization going on, did the United States actually use any forces in Europe? Um, yes, but just a few. And, it is, and they found that they could use mules, especially uh, in Italy, because of the terrain. And I've gotten into, uh, but the, those were used for supplies because of the mountainous area in Italy. I've gotten in trouble with the old horse cavalry guys a number of times out at Fort Riley because I would argue that, you know what killed the horse cavalry? The Jeep. The Jeep could go anywhere a horse could go. And it was easier to maintain. And it was easier to take apart. Now, some of you guys may <laughs> argue with me on that, <laughs> but... Uh, it is. And I know, uh, and I, I speak from experience, because in our new museum design, we uh, took a Jeep apart, uh, had to bring it upstairs because we wanted it in an exhibit on the second floor of a building that was built in 1855, and then they had to put it back together. And I will tell you, those gentlemen that worked on that, you know, were saints, although uh, I could hear uh, some language coming out from my office as they were putting it together. So... Yes, sir. So you, so you mentioned Ford's contribution with Americans driving Model Ts. In the movie a few years ago, Ford versus Ferrari, there's a point where Henry Ford II looks out his corporate window at his factories and says, I've already been to war. I won, I won the war with what we contributed. What was, what was Ford's contribution in all those vehicles? And is that uh, Ford actually, um, oh, they built Jeeps because they were both Willis and Ford. I believe that uh, Ford also built some of the quarter-ton trucks. I may be. I do know this, that my tank, uh, that I have my Sherman tank that is out at Fort Riley, I've looked inside in, uh, the engine deck, and that tank was built by Cadillac. But everybody got into the act in World War II with building uh, vehicles. Uh, Cadillac, uh, General Motors, Willis, Ford, and so Ford actually, though, with contributing to the, the Jeep and the, uh, the quarter ton or the three quarter ton truck uh, winning the war. Because look at all the trucks we sent to, to, to Russia. Yes, sir. You didn't talk about uh, the contributions from Air Force and airplanes, but Ford also built yeah. bombers. They built bombers. That's correct. I think they built the B-24s. Yeah, they, yeah B-24s. Which, and I, I've had the opportunity, don't, oh, I'm being recorded here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to live with this. But um, I talked to a couple of veterans. Uh, I talked to a, um, a pilot of a B-24, and I've talked to pilots of a B-17. And what I've gotten is, oh, that B-24 had a larger bomb load and a great endurance, but, oh, was it a pig to fly. They basically said, but, yeah, the B-24 was built by Ford. Yes, sir. But yeah, industrial ability and how we tooled up so quickly. And I, that was George Marshall. That's, I give that to George Marshall and FDR and saying, we're going to get into this thing, but we need to tool up immediately. And it has a benefit. It brought us out of the Great Depression. So, well, thank you. Oh, yes. Uh, I'm, I'm not a veteran, but somewhere I have read where the ratio of Frontline troops to logistics was roughly one in five. One in five, and I think it's actually gotten to one in ten now, or even higher today. 
One in four. Yeah, the logistical tale is just incredible. I mean, so. Uh, I have an announcement. Come on up. Jack is a member of my foundation, uh, my uh, board foundation. So I'm going to turn it over to Jack. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Uh, I'm Jack Lynn Quills. And he's a much better speaker than I am. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a member of the board of directors for the Friends of the Fort Riley Museums. And it's a pleasure to work with Dr. Bob and to see some of the history that we've captured here. For this presentation, there's a million more stories that he's able to share. And we're really excited about having the organization, the Friends of Fort Riley Museums, because as you all know, there are some things that our government support that's helping. What's the investment in renovations? Um, okay, total number 13 and a half million to restore the museums, the, the three buildings, and another three million to create the exhibit. So we're talking 17 and a half million dollars that so was put in. That sounds like an incredible investment, but uh, that doesn't even include getting the, watch, the clock tower. Uh, to operate again. So that's one of the things that the foundation uh, is planning to do, or the Friends of the Fort Riley Museums. It's also something that struck me when I joined the board was that Dr. Bob can't even get toilet paper without a requisition form, and it takes a while to get those processed. And so rather than him going to Goodwill for support, the organization can help with supplies and logistics. And so uh, there's a number of things that uh, we plan on helping support with the organization. There is an event that you can all get involved in uh, that's happening on the 11th Veterans Day, and that is, I just have a, a handful here for anybody that needs to access it, but uh, the event is called Stand a Match, and it's the Armed Forces Match Day uh, for contributions that's going to be going on with all of the organizations in this area, uh, and a lot of them are based out of Manhattan, Fort Riley area. Uh, but these organizations have tied in with the Greater Manhattan Community Foundation, so you can make a contribution and receive a tax-deductible uh, credit for that support. It's going to be matched at 50%, so that's why we wanted to be involved in this event, because if you make a, a $25 or $50 or $100 or $1,000 donation, uh, there's going to be another 50% added to what you did. And uh, that's going to help us out considerably in getting our organization launched and uh, get that support that Dr. Bob needs for the, the simpler things, as well as some of the things that are going to really make uh, better events, better displays, uh, better activities like this uh, with more support that we can cover some of those expenses that can't be done by the requisition process. So uh, there's a few flyers here that uh, uh, we can give you, but uh, if you just go online and go to standtomatch.com, uh, you'll be able to uh, find the links and make your contributions on the 11th. Thank you. Oh, Doug, the remodeled museums will be open by this time next year. Oh, great. Did you all hear that? Uh, Bob said that the remodeled museums will be open by this time next year over Fort Riley. So it's been a long process for you. I'm sure you'll be glad to open that door for the... Seven years. Seven years. Wow. Well, thank you all for coming out today. I'd like to thank Bob again for a wonderful presentation. I remember reading some point where... I'm really fascinated with the whole mechanization process, and, and it's amazing to me how the country just came together. And you couldn't buy cars, and you, civilian automobiles were not heard of, everything was rationed. All the supplies went to the armed forces. At the height of the production, I understand they were making a Jeep per minute. That's really production. And I heard that even Hitler knew where Detroit was. <laughs> so. Anyway, it's very fascinating, and thank you, Dr. Bob. And let's remind you that. Uh, uh, Kevin and Wendy and, and Julie and Bernie, the owners of some of the vehicles out here, the military vehicles, gone for about another hour or so. So please go out if you want to learn more about their vehicles. I'm sure they'd be look more than glad to tell you a little bit about them. And just enjoy all the displays, the uniform display out in the lobby, and uh, the other cars that are on the museum as well. So thank you again, Bob. You're welcome. And, uh, thank you all. <laughs>